so yeah, my name is Eduardo and okay, just one thing though, because I'm hearing myself and it's going to be very difficult if I just do the talk like this, <laughs> should I mute me? It wasn't like that before, so. Okay, let me mute myself, so, like something like the volume or something. I don't know which one is doing this, but. Can I mute? Can I can I mute the Zoom? Oh, I don't listen myself anymore. <laughs> I believe we can't hear you anymore. Now we they can. can hear me? Now we can, yeah, but now, uh, if... <laughs> now it's good, I think. No, I, I cannot hear myself twice, so that's perfect. Nice. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Otherwise, it would have been a bit difficult. So yeah, my name is Eduardo. I, I work as a freelance, and I do spend most of my time today uh, working on open source, and more specifically, working on View Router and the next version. But like about 80% of my time, like my working time now, I'm able to dedicate it to open source, so that's amazing. I'm very grateful for that. But it wasn't always the case, right? So I started as a user of your router more than a maintainer and uh, so i will build my applications using the router and i would at some point start maintaining the router and i would see these problems that we can um, have and how to solve them in different ways um, and so it gave me i know very well the pains i know very well how easy it is to start with the routing because the api is so simple but i also know how hard it is to do some advanced things and how hard it's to connect the different parts of the application so today I want to go from that very simple API that we have in your router, and I want to explain you um, a bit more of the insides of your router, uh, how, a bit of the failures, or rather the, the problems that I think that exist today, and so how do we solve them for the next version, and give you a more of a, an inner view uh, of the, the library, and try to um, uh, bring you more about how to use the router and by understanding how it works behind the scenes and explaining some of the parts that are more complicated and all that complexity that is hidden behind the simple API. Because when we use the router, we just do a new router. We have this array of routes and we just have to specify for this URL slash search, I want you to display the search component. For these other movies that has a, an, an, an ID, I want you to display the, the movie detail uh, component. So um after that you just have to put these router view components somewhere in your application and then it's going to display the right component so it's going to take the url and it's going to build these kind of normalized uh, object location and from there it's going to display in the router view whatever you need right but there is still a lot of things happening uh, so when we go from the url to these object and then we get that to the to the, to the user we, we're going through the router um, so the router is also communicating to the URL. And I want to talk about what happens in between, right? What is, what is in there between the, the user ourselves and um, the URL? So in between, the first thing we're gonna talk, uh, we're gonna notice is that we have some kind of history module, a little bit more about that in, in, in the future, but it is gonna control the URL, it's gonna talk to the URL. And we also have something called a matcher, which is not accessible directly by the user either, like history, but it does play a very, very important role when it comes to routing. And it's gonna be a big part of the dynamic routing, for example, topic. And then we have the components, but these, you probably know about them because you use them, router view and router link. So we as a user, we are happy because we get this um, object that is easy to use, right? And personally, uh, I've seen the limitations, not only because of my own usage when I use the router, but also because I also face it other people's usage. So things like, why do we have page as a string if it's clearly a number? Um, why cannot use params to pass some state uh, alongside the navigation? Uh, how can we change the URL but keep the same uh, visible view or the opposite, change the visible view but have another URL? So um, I find myself, myself knowing, frustrated because I want to use these features but they do not exist. Um, and if the problem is I'm both persons, right? I'm the user and I'm the maintainer. So I turn to myself and see, oh, why can I, 
why can't the library do this? So as a maintainer, I'm like, well, the library cannot do that because if we introduce this behavior, it will break another existing behavior that is useful to other people. And this is very abstract because I wouldn't be able to go into details um, of how complicated are, the, are the, the things. But people ask for other things. So I can also see all these other use cases like Twitter models uh, or dynamic routing. So I have these inner conflict uh, with myself. Like I cannot do this exactly with the, with the version that we have because we're going to break things. But with view router th uh, with view three coming, that's a different a different story because uh, we can introduce some breaking changes to bring all the imp these improvements that we have been waiting for so long. So today I'm going to talk about what's new in view three routing. So that will be the version four of view router. I know it's a bit confusing, but the v the version three of view router is for view two. So the first thing and the most um, the thing that most people want is dynamic routing. Now, in the current version, we have dynamic routing, which means that we can only add routes, but we cannot remove any of them. We can replace them, we can only add them. Uh, so we have these function add routes that takes an array of routes and you can add the routes, but once they are there, you cannot remove them. I mean, you can do some hacks, but maybe some people know about the hacks, but something you shouldn't be doing. Now, the API that uh, comes uh, for view Router 4 is going to be these four functions that are very, very simple when it, in terms of API, you have functions to add route and other functions to remove them. And then you have a function that can check if a route exists and a function to return all the routes. So um, just as a note, the name that you can see, so you have add route and it has a name about when you can remove the route using that name, you can also use a symbol. Uh, so you can have arbitrary names so you don't have to really provide a name. And the same for the has route. But something that I can kind of show because it doesn't really fit in the slide is that when you add a route, it returns a function that you can call to remove it. So it also allows you this kind of flexibility where you don't have a way to refer to the route uh, with no symbols, no name. And the whole idea is in an RFC that has been merged. So if you want to look at the, the API, you can go there. But what is interesting about dynamic routing is not the API itself, but what it takes to get there, right? So um, in order to talk about the, the complexity of dynamic routing, I want to talk about the order of routes in the route option when you create a router. So imagine you have these new, these first route where you have the path and you have a, a parameter, the ID, and then you add, decide to add another route that has just the, the word about in it. The thing is that route is never going to um, be matched by the router. And the reason is because about also matches the first route with the ID. So in order to talk about these, we're going to talk about the matcher. The matcher is the, the, the module of the router that is going to handle that. So for instance, it's able to handle the transformation from a URL into an object. So it's going to extract that 493922 number and put it into the ID of the parents because we created a route saying that, hey, we have these movies slash colon ID and the matcher is going to transform that into functions and it's going to be able to extract everything that is interesting. It's going to give you back the name of the route, the components to render, et cetera, et cetera. But it goes further than that because it can also do the other direction, right? It can take the name and then an object of parameters and build the URL for you. Now I say, uh, the other direction, but in reality, this is the same operation. This is just normalization of, of uh, allocation. Okay, that's what the matcher takes in, in um, as an input, and it gives you a normalized location with everything. Now, to do that, uh, we use regular expressions. So we transform that path that you gave us, give us in the route option, and we generate a regular expression. For example, home becomes just the string home, but when you have a dynamic parameter like colon ID, you have a group in a regular expression saying anything but a slash uh, one or more times. And you can even customize that reg regular expression with parentheses, and that's gonna just use that as the regular expression. Now, the problem is when we add another route, well, the regular expression is gonna just be that movies slash new for a path that is just a static path. Uh, path. So then the matcher, when it has to check for the URL what to display, is going to go in order, one after the other one. So it just go, goes on the first one, say home, and it doesn't match. So it goes into the next one, and it matches. So it just stops there, right? It says, I found, the, I found the, right, the right record, so I just re returned this one. But the thing is, we wanted to match the last one, right? So as a user, we just look at that and say, oh, why, why didn't my 
my actual road product match. And we are not necessarily uh, conscious that the, the order in the routes matters. So how do we solve this problem? One, one way to solve it is by ranking the routes. So to rank them, we're going to give them a score. The higher the score, the earlier they are, they are checked. They're going to create an order in the route. So for example, here, if we reorder based on a different score, we're going to find that the movies slash new is going to be tested first because it's more complex, so to say, has a, a, a higher score. Now, how does the scoring, scoring work? Uh, the scoring works by associating an um, amount of points to each, each section of the route. So a section is just what you have in between two slashes. So for example, home has one section, but, homes, uh, but movies slash news, new has two sections. And now just to be fair, uh, this is a simplistic version of the ranking system. In Vue Archer, the ranking system is a bit more complicated because we can have multiple params in one segment. So that's a bit more complicated. It's not just a number, it's an array of arrays of numbers. So that's, this is just an example of how a simple matcher and a simple ranking system works. And this is something that has, that is used in other routers. So um, home has a 70 points because it has one static segment. It's just the string home. But a movie is new has two static segments. So that's 70 times two. Uh, and if we look at movies ID, then we have two segments, but one of them is a, is a parameter. It's a dynamic segment. So that's worth 60 points, a bit lower. So it has a lower ranking. And then the one with a custom uh, regular expression gets a bon bonus of five points. And using this system is uh, how we rank the routes. Now, this um, whole ranking thing doesn't exist in, in Vue Router. Right now, it exists on the version 4 for Vue 3. And introducing it will have been a bit of a breaking change because we have to change how uh, some of the routes are generated because in the next version, we have our own um, parsing. So we have our own compiler that generates the regular expressions from these paths. And in the current version, we use a library called path to regex. Uh, so in our version, we can generate ranking directly and, and rank them. Um, so this is everything that you have. It's not everything, but it's what is done in the matcher to get that URL and be able to match against the right record. And it means that in, in Eurorter 4, you don't even have to worry anymore about the order. Otherwise, dynamic routing would have been possible. But such an API is, uh, is hiding uh, all this complexity of dynamic routing and it, of, um, sorry, of route ranking or other path ranking. And uh, that is very interesting, but it's still not everything, right? We still have the history playing a big role. Now, in current version, you have this new router. Uh, so you have a class that you instantiate and you have to pass a mode that can be hash, history, or abstract. Um, so abstract is going to be for the some in-memory history that is used for server-side rendering and history and hash are used on the client, depending on what you want. And then you have to do view use router and pass the router instance to, uh, to the, the root of your application. For the next version is a bit, a bit different. So we are moving away from classes so that your final bundle is smaller because it minifies better. And we have this history instead of mode when, where we can pass an instance of a custom history implementation. So this has multiple benefits. Uh, for instance, is tree shakeable. It means that if you're not using the hash history or the in-memory history, well, it's not going to be included in your final bundle. Uh, but it's also, uh, allow, it also allows custom history implementations like native script or other native implementations for mobile and stuff like that. Um, there is also the, the, the simplified app.use is also right, really cool. You just have to do app.use. It reads very well. It's very um, uh, expressive when it comes to uh, I'm using the router in the application. And, and the store, Vuex, is the same syntax for v3. v3. Now, all these, um, the create web history uh, is behind the scene using the history API, so that also known as HTML5 history API. So it's not that complicated and you don't need to use it when you use the router directly. But I think it's nice to know uh, some of the things that exist and what is the actual API, because you might be exposed to using, for example, the data, which is a state that we use and the limitation it comes with. So the history API has two functions, push state and replace state, 
we have one event, uh, which is the pop state, and we have two variables, the history.state and history.length. So push state and replace state have the exact same signature. So we're taking the first argument, uh, a piece of state um, that is going to be saved in history the state. Then they take a title, which is a string, but it's not used by almost any browser. So at the end, we just always pass an empty string uh, because I think only Firefox in some version is going to use it, but nobody else does. So it's been there for so long, but still we don't use it. <laughs> And finally, you have the URL, which is what you want to put in the in the URL bar, of course. So the difference between push state and replace state is that one is going to push into a stack, and the other one is going to replace the the entry we are at. And if there is something else above, uh, it's going to remove it because it's not exactly a stack. We treat it as a stack when it comes to manipulations, but we can move a cursor in in in, in between the the stack when we navigate through the interface, like going back and forward in the in the navigator. That's going to show a different. A different page. I'm going to show that as an, with an example. Now, the add event listener allows us to to detect when the user clicks back and forward, so we can change whatever we need internally. And finally, these two pieces of state deserve their own slide. So we're going to take an example to talk about them. Uh, imagine we we visit a, a website called Movies.com that I invented, but we're going to see that the history of the state it's initially equal to null. And the length of the history is just one, because the only entry that we have in a history is that one, movies.com. So then we're going to call push state, which is what router, the router does, but you're never going to have to do in your own code. And it's going to push with some object from null, and it's going to just pass an empty string as the title because it's not used, and then say, I want to put slash releases. So that's going to change the URL, it's going to set the state to that object with the from null, and it's going to increment the length of the history. And now we can uh, also push another another um, state. It's going to push a, a URL with search and a query. And we're going to push an object in the data that's from releases. And that's going to change the URL, change the state, and then increment the length of the history. And the thing is that if we click on the back button, it's going to go back to the previous state. It's going to change the URL. Um, put the, the old state in the history of the state, but the length is still the same because we can still go forward. Now, that's what I was talking about. If we push again here, we're going to remove the, the forward entr entry. Um, so then we can, of course, go forward again, and it's going to change uh, the entry to another one. So the thing is, if we want to um, implement a custom history, this is the API that view router for needs. But to be completely honest, uh, it should still go through an RFC to gather feedback about people. I've been talking with people from the uh, native script community, um, but I still, I still haven't heard uh, back enough from them uh, to uh, finalize this and to push uh, like a final public API for people to implement their custom histories. That being said, you probably will never need to do a custom history because the web history is enough for your needs. You also have the hash history as well. And you have three functions that are exactly the same as the ones that we have seen before in the in a, with history um, push that we have. The push, which is push state, replace, replace state, and listen, which is the event listener. So there is still a question is how do we go from this URL to this final object that contains not only the params, but also the query object, the hash, and the path all split differently. So to know, to know that, we need to understand a little bit better how the URL works and what is exactly the URL. So we need to understand that the URL is divided in three sections, the path, the query, which is also referred as search uh, some, some places, and the hash, which is also referred, referred as fragment in the specification of HTML. Now, all these three um, properties are readable through the global object location. So the path is accessible through location.pathName, the query is accessible through uh, location.search, and the hash is accessible through location.hash. All of them as a string. And you can also get the whole thing as a one single string on the href. But uh, so when we go from this URL to this object, we are um, exporting, extracting different sections, but there is still the query that needs to be parsed. It needs to be um, changed into an object. So, and we also need the other operation, right? We need to go back to the uh, string version. So the question is, how do we do that? And in modern browsers, you have, and in Node as well, you have these uh, URL search params API 
but it's very nice because you just um, create an instance of it with a string and then you can go through all the keys and get all the values and it's very easy to build the object and it should handle the encoding and everything for you pretty neat but uh, the problem is that uh, Internet Explorer doesn't support it at all it doesn't exist and Safari uh, has some bugs in previous versions not the latest version of Safari, but some of them have bugs with uh, space and coding. So at the end, if you really want to use this API, uh, well, you either need to provide a polyfill or just re-implement yourself, which is basically the same as Web Components. And it's one of the reasons that nobody uses Web Components, right? So at the end, for, our, for, for us, it's a no-go because we need to support Internet Explorer. So we just um, put that away and we build the run version that implements that and we can handle all the encoding the way we want and so it matches all the browsers, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's how we go from the URL from to that complex object with all the params, the hash, name, the component, using the history and the matcher at the same time together. Um, but there's still a question that uh, remains is how do we handle correctly the encoding? And this is something that it's funny because I feel that people are either well-documented on the topic or they know absolutely nothing about it. <laughs> they, like there is no middle ground in, in it. So I want to um, make it a bit, a bit easier for everybody. I want to explain the, the basics of encoding and what do you need to know from the router perspective so you don't have any encoding problem. Um, so the encoding is all the percentage something they've seen in the URL. The, the most common one is the space, uh, which is known to be percentage 20. So in the URL, you may have seen uh, percentage 20 um, when using any browser. Now, the URL encoding, usually what it does is it takes the character X value. So for example, the double quote, that will be 22. And it gives you uh, an encoded version, the percentage character, and then the number. But it's not that easy because when you go beyond ASCII characters, uh, it takes... Uh, <laughs> It takes a little bit more, um, it's a bit more complicated when it comes to the encoding. It takes a small part of the, the, the binary representation and it gives you different numbers. So for example, the end character, even though the encoding, the hexadecimal value is F1, it will still give you C3B1. <laughs> the good news is you don't, you don't have to know these because you use a function to create them anyway, but it's still um, important to know this because uh, I think I'm frozen. It's still important to know because um, if you um, if you're a user, you don't understand what C three uh, B one means. But if you're a developer, you do know. So you want to display something to the user that makes sense, uh, or at least you want to make sure that you you do the best so the browser does it because you don't have all the control you want to and you you wish you had. The thing is, if you want to display an HTML tag in the URL for any reasons, you have to display it this way. And as you can imagine, this is absolutely not readable by user. So what are the rules for URL encoding? The rules for URL encoding are actually three, and they are very simple. Uh, you have to encode anything that is non-printable. So that goes from the null character to the unity separator, and also the delete character. And then you have to uh, encode anything beyond that character, the delete character. So everything strictly superior to the um, tilde character has to be encoded. So basically anything that is not ASCII. Uh, and then you have to encode the percentage character as well, of course, because that's used for the encoding itself. So if you want to represent the percentage, you have to encode it. But that's not it. You have also specific rules for the three sections of the URL. So the easiest one is the hash. The hash, you need to encode the space, which is that small square down there. Then you need to encode the, the double quotes. And then you have the smaller that than and the bigger than as well as the backting. All these characters, all these um, five characters need to be encoded. Now on the path, you have all these characters as well. And on top of that, you have to encode the hash, the interrogation mark, and the curly braces. Now the hash and the interrogation mark make a lot of sense because, because um, they are used later on in the URL. So if you want to use them in the path, you need to encode them so that the browser is able to um, split up the URL correctly. The curly braces, I don't even know where they come from. I think it was, they wanted to reserve them from some specific, from some, uh, specific syntax, but I, I haven't seen it uh, used anywhere. The query is very similar. You take everything from the hash, you remove the backtick, and you have the hash 
the ampersand and the equal. Now these make sense for because the hash is used after, so it has to be encoded. The ampersand is because it's used for the query syntax and the same for equal. I don't know the reason the backtick is not in query, but it doesn't need to be encoded in query. So these are the rules. And it, so far it looks pretty simple, but let's take it to the practical field. Let's um, set the location of hash in the browser, in different browsers, to this value, hash, space, uh, double quote, smaller, bigger than, and the backtick. So to be clear and to be fair, these, you shouldn't be doing this because the hash value should be encoded. But it's interesting to note how different browsers um, use it, and you're going to understand why in a moment. So if you do that in Safari, then we can read again the variable location.hash and see what it contains, and we're going to get the same exact value that we, we provided. If we look at the URL, though, I'm, I'm saying looking because it's really just what you see, you're going to see that the space is encoded for some reason. Now, this doesn't make any sense, to be fair, because it means that you're giving the developer the, the non-encoded version, so the readable version, but the final user is getting the non-readable version, only for the space, though. <laughs> so on Firefox, though, uh, we get the encoder version. Now, this is really nice because it means that the browser is protecting the developer. So we get the actual legal value that should be there. And on top of that, on the URL, you see the regular value. So it's very readable for the user. And that's amazing because you're really providing the best possible values for both ends, the developer and the, the end user. Now in Chrome, you also have the encoded value on the hash, on the variable. But then for some reason on the URL, some characters are encoded and some are not. The space and the backtick, they appear uh, encoded. I don't know actually the actual reason behind that, but that's how it is. At least we do get the encoded version in the, in the variable, which is what we want. And Internet Explorer doesn't do anything. So I just take the same value in both places and that's it. Um, no question asked. Now let's take a look at how, um, how they behave if we do encode URI. So the, this will be the actual right behavior. So we are setting to the actual value that Firefox and Chrome were giving us, right? The, the encoded version. And so if we do that on Safari, it's going to read the encoded version, so the exact same value that we give it. And then on the URL, the same thing. We're going to see the encoded version. It's, it's OK. It could have been better, but it's OK. What's interesting is that Firefox is going to still get, well, the same encoded version, I mean, um, yeah, encoded version, and, but it's going to still display the unencoded version, right? It's going to still display a version that is readable for the user. And it's also consistent with the other behavior. Chrome um, does the same thing. It's consistent with the other behavior. So it still displays these encoded characters for the, spa uh, the space and the backtick, but I still, at least it's, uh, it's consistent with the other behavior. And Internet Explorer doesn't do anything, so it just takes the value as is. Now, um, Safari is a bit weird, um, to be honest, especially the percentage 20. Uh, and I think it's part of some of the bugs that they had on the URL search params, but, but I cannot confirm. Um, Firefox is perfect. It's basically the, the best situation you could have. Chrome is great uh, because we're still having a protection for the developer and something relatively nice for the user. And Internet Explorer doesn't do anything. It's like they skip that lesson or something. <laughs> so these are the, the scenarios that where everything works well. No matter the version that we do, as a developer, if we do the mistake of doing the non-encoded version, it will still work. So that's great, but not every user are using that those browsers, right? So if in the browser, sorry, if, if in our code, we do a push with a string or using the path, and we're passing something that is not encoded, like a space, well, depending on the browser, they're going to behave differently. Because when you call push state after that, uh, some will encode it, some will not. Not and depend depending on if it's in the path or the hash is gonna behave differently based on the browser. I show you the hash because it's not the most buggy one, but the other ones are not that great either. So what do we do instead of that? Well, you can push the encoder version manually, which I don't recommend, but you can also use the name version with the parameters. So if you use the params version with the name route, um, View Router will properly encode the params as they should. And the browser will display as it can, 
but at least it will be consistent across all browsers. And if a user tries to copy paste a URL and share with someone else and they open that page in another browser, it's going to have the same behavior. And that's important. So never use these versions uh, when, you, when you have encoded characters that are written there. Um, you can use this version manually encoding the version, but what is really great is using uh, the name routes for this. And make sure also, just to note, if you use a query, it's the same thing, okay? If you have values that can contain illegal characters, use the query so they can get encoded automatically. So uh, we can push uh, to a URL and we can see that in the navigation bar, but we can also navigate to, uh, to a URL through a link. And so we have multiple links in, the, in our page and depending on where we are, we are gonna display some of those links as active, right? So one of the problems that we have currently on View Router is that the homepage or the, rather the active mechanism for links is not ideal. Uh, for instance, the hash, the hash, the slash, so the homepage is always going to be active no matter where you are because it's an inclusive uh, matching. Um, and that's not that great. So if you are on this page, users slash 24 slash post, the homepage is going to appear active. It's going to have that class router link active. Uh, another link, uh, users 24 post, which is the exact same as the URL, is going to have both router link active and router link exact active. So this is, you, you, may, you may think, oh, this is okay, this is fine. We can, we can work with this. The problem is that, uh, so this is a behavior, a table with a, with a behavior. If you go to slash or if you use the name version of home, you're gonna get the link active. If you have users slash 24, you also get the link active, but not the exact active. And for users uh, 24 profile, which will be like the end of the year old changing, you don't get the active nor the exact active. Well, the one that matches exactly the URL get both of them. So the thing is you can use exact to remove that active behavior uh, when you want, and it's gonna remove the link active for every, every single link except for the 24 post, but because it's gonna align uh, the matching of both classes. But the problem with this behavior is that is we have something else in the URL like a hash. So for example, I added the appended the hash related to the URL, which is something very common when you want to anchor in some place in the page. Then if you have the exit prop, uh, the links are not going to be active anymore. And this is problematic. You can also, even if you don't have the exit prop, you will find your, yourself in situations where the hash is different. And then the link is not going to be active anymore because it has to be inclusive. And then uh, if a hash is missing or a query property is missing, it doesn't work anymore. The truth is most of the time, what we want to look at is not the hash or the query, but just the, the path the, of the URL. So the behavior that we would like to have is something like this. The, the home should not be active when we are in the post um, URL because it's not related directly to that URL. But user slash 24 is the parent of user slash 24 slash post. So it should be active in that, in that meaning. Um, and users 24 post should be exactly active in both ways. Now, this is a bit more complicated because it also handles aliases and, and other, other stuff with uh, nested aliases and, and, and stuff. Uh, so if you wanna go through the whole thing, which is more complex and has a lot of tables, there is an RFC that has been merged, but it's still like any other RFC, nothing is reaching forever. We can still change these things. Uh, that changes behavior. So in view router four, you won't have to worry much about the exact pro because it disappears anyway, it's not there anymore. And the active uh, behavior is now uh, more consistent regarding to the rec records of the routes you add and not just to the URL and what it looks like, because that's something that you can use. You can build yourself very easily, but uh, matching it when it comes to records is something that only the router knows how to do. So it's very, it was always very difficult to build by yourself on, on the current version of your router. So if we come back to this example of, of the, the links, and how we can also use router push. Um, we want to talk about um, something that was introduced recently uh, are the navigation failures. Now, this is more of a, so in the current version, uh, we introduced this very recently and it has been popping out errors everywhere. Um, and it's very confusing when, it, when you first see it. Um, so 
the one of the ways, the most common way, and the one that probably most people have seen is when you push to the same location you are at um, by accident or not, you get this in the console saying, uh, uncaught in promise, error, avoided redundant navigation. Now, the problem with this is the word error. The, the navigation failure only means that the navigation didn't happen because we're pushing to the same location we are at, for example, or we cancel the navigation through a navigation guard by calling next polls. So the router is going to abort the navigation and say nothing. We're not going there. Um, so that's what the promise returned by router push is uh, rejected. And because promise rejections that are not handled produce an error, that's why we gave in the console. But it's fine to have the error, it's just that it's quite bothersome to uh, see the logs and have to distinguish them from other actual errors when it shouldn't be like that. So where did these come from? Well, initially, we only had these first version, on complete, on abort, that returned nothing. And you could pass a callback to uncomplete and on abort, see if the navigation succeed or fail. With the introduction of the Promise API, um, this function router push will return a promise that will resolve on complete and reject on abort. And this is when we realized that most people were not even using on um, complete on abort um, at all. And when you had an abortion, well, you didn't see it anywhere because it was just a function that was never called. But when we return a promise, if you don't catch the rejection, you get that error on the console. So what are we doing to change this? So if we take the, let's take about another problem that we have because it's not the end. The problem about the, the uncomplete on abort is that uncomplete is also um, globally catchable, so to say, uh, with router after each. But on abort, you cannot know. There is no global way to know if a navigation is finished. Where, wherever it, it failed, or it didn't fail, it succeed. So to go from one to the other, what we're introducing is this failure concept that is available on the router for. So we are merging these two in the failure that is an optional um, promise res re resolution. And this failure also appear in every after reach. So anytime a, uh, a router push, push will almost always resolve unless there is an uncaught error in the navigation and then it will it will reject. So that will be the actual, like you should look at the error because then you have to handle it. But then if you have a navigation duplicator or something like that, it will not reject the promise. It will still resolve the promise and you still are able to check what happened if you need to. So this is the introduction of the, the navigation failure type. Uh, I think it, there is a typo, like there is a types, maybe an S doesn't really matter because you have another completion. But um, you can check if the failure exists. If it exists, it means that the navigation didn't succeed. And then you can check the type, uh, and you have multiple times th types. Now, these types are navigation failure, um, so canceled. Uh, that's when you call next false. You have a board. Either it's a new navigation that happens while another one is waiting for a, for a, a sync something. And then you have the duplicated, which is a red run navigation, so the navigation doesn't happen at all. So these are how you, you can you can uh, get them. And uh, we're introducing that on the current version of U router uh, 3 as well, so the, the migration is easier. And if you want to check the whole discussion about it and the, the, all the details, you can check the RFC as well. Now, this is not the only thing. Uh, this is not the only thing. We also have another improvement that comes with these global handling, it's a scroll behavior. Now, scroll behavior today is lacking quite a few features, in my opinion. One of them being the global, uh, like, on load, but also uh, on the some pop states and stuff, we, we don't, we're not able to always trigger it. So we are not only changing the API for something a bit simpler um, and to allow the smooth scroll behavior and other things, but we're also introducing the fact that scroll behavior happens also with failed navigations. So with navigation failures, it will also happen. So if you click on the same link uh, twice, but you have a scroll behavior that makes it scroll, it will still scroll like a normal link. For example, you have a hash to a title and you click on the link and then you scroll again and you click again, it will still scroll again like a regular link, which is something that doesn't happen uh, today because the scroll behavior is not invoked in that kind of navigation. So the other change is when it comes to the API. We are removing selector and offset, 
and we are going for a flat structure where we have the L that allows you to also specify a, an element directly. Um, and you have top and left, which align both of them with the scroll to options. And thanks to these, we can also apply stuff like behavior smooth, which is going to create a smooth scrolling. The only browser not supporting it is Safari, but it, they are working on it. And um, Internet Explorer, but because it's not a browser now, uh, I don't include it in the list. So uh, it's very nice because you get that smooth scrolling um, for free <laughs> without doing anything. And you can also add it as just a, a CSS um, CSS property like scroll behavior smooth. So any scroll to that you do with your Archer will be smooth by default. And if you want to look more about the scroll behavior, I think this one is still open. So give it a look um, and give your feedback. Another thing coming uh, to well, Vue Archer 4 are composition functions. So the composition API that exists in Vue will, of course, be used and exposed differently for the, for the router. So we have use link that allows you to use all the behavior of a router link, but without using the vslot API. It's pretty much the same thing when it comes to what you can use and not. You have use route to um, get the route in the setup function. You have use router to get the router instance in the setup function. And then you have only for route update and only for route leave, which are the navigation guards for component. The only one that doesn't exist is only for route enter because it's not possible to, um, to, to call the hook from the component since the hook has to happen before the component is mounted because it happens before we navigate. So that's the only one that cannot exist. Uh, use link uh, is useful when you want to create your own custom version of router link and change anything you want. For instance, you could decide to apply uh, different classes or you could create your own uh, overload of, of a router link. Now, it, it does look a lot like the vslot API because it's the same API for that vslot exists, um, but it's very powerful and it allows you to get anything from the route and create some very uh, some router links that integrate very, very well with your application and how you define routes because you can include things in the meta property of the route and then use it for the text, stuff like that. It can be really, really cool. Uh, when it comes to the on before route update and on before I'll leave, or you just add them to the, oops, I have a typo there. I forgot to call next. I have to call next inside of that promise. Otherwise it won't work. Um, but you can, for example, update the user that you have on your uh, view um, by defining this hook on the, on the setup. And it will be removed when you are, when the component is um, unmounted. <laughs> there is another feature that is very nice uh, is disconnecting router view from the URL. So you have this prop route that allows you to define what route the router view should be um, uh, rendering. And this is very useful when you combine it with the resolve function of the router. Um, so you can resolve uh, a location. And with this, you can store something in the history state. And it allows you to, for example, display models on the, on the page without changing the actual component that you're seeing, but changing the URL which means that if you navigate through the interface, you can show a model, but if you directly go to the URL, you're gonna see a different page. So it's something like the Twitter model, basically. And it's implement, you can implement these through the through these um, probe. Now, if you wanna know more about the, this RFC, um, it's router view, uh, route prop. It's an open RFC. I invite you to take a look. It's an interesting one. So this is, pretty much the whole um, like um, structure of the router behind the scenes. There is a bit more, of course, because there is a small modules of utility functions like encoding and stuff like that, that we're not um, showing, but it's more internal is they're not meant to be used externally or, or there, there isn't much to, to know about them. So to put it in a nutshell, we have things like dynamic router, custom history, and better encoding defaults. Uh, so there are other, other bugs that are quite difficult to um, fix without breaking other things when it comes to encoding in the current version of your router, and all of them have been, have been fixed without like, correcting all the, without breaking the other things for, for encoding on uh, the new version. Uh, we also have the composition API, as we have seen. We have navigation direction, although I still probably need to go through, through an RFC. But we know in most scenarios, if we're going backward or forward, when you use the, the buttons, and we can expose that information to the user. And we have better types we support and plans to add more as well. 
and because of the how the code uh, is currently split into different modules that have um, more better defined um, responsibilities, it's easier to contribute um, where when you have a bug or when you want to fix a bug, you know it's easier to know where you should touch and, and check. And we will also have more per case documentation. So we're planning on having a cookbook about, for example, accessibility and some topics like the changing the title, uh, the um, announcing the navigations, but also how do you do models? How do you do uh, generic data fetching? Like some patterns that you can use. Uh, the idea from the router for the router is to be uh, quite low level so people can implement their own things uh, that work in all the different scenarios, which are so, so, so many because um, the router uh, touches all the sections of your application and it can inter intervene at any time. So you need to have very flexible APIs for that. On top of that, um, uh, all your router, the current router is about nine kilobytes and the next version is about seven. Uh, even though it has way many more features and it has all the, all, all the previous features as well. Uh, there is a way that we can even reduce these even more with more simpler matches and um, exposing lower level fun um, like functions to create a leaner router, but it's something that might come later uh, because it's still not the, the, the priority right now. If you want to take a look at the, at the view router, uh, just so you know, you have the, um, the repository is public. Um, I check it all the time when there are bugs, reports, and stuff like that. Um, we're almost, we're very, very close to beta. There are a few things that we need to um, work on for on, on view as well and, and coordinate to make uh, the last few features missing uh, on view router next. And it's going pretty well. So if you want to contribute or anything, just go by. And that's everything I want to say. And I want to thank you, my sponsors, uh, thanks to which I'm also able to work more and more on open source. Um, and just so you know, I have a $1 sponsorship, uh, which is the most accessible I could, I could do on GitHub because I don't think I can go lower. And I'm very grateful for the one, for everybody uh, giving any amount um, for, to support the, the open source work I do. I hope you learned something about your router and that you're excited to use the next version. And thank you for your attention and I will answer the questions. Oh. Okay, uh, so let's start with the most Hollywood question we could probably have. Uh, how do you, as a core member, feel about composition API and uh, how the router benefit from using composition API? Basically, uh, if I start with a new view free project, should I target using router as a composition API part or as an option API? Mm, I think you, you can use both. For the router specifically, you can use, you can use both. But um, there aren't that many APIs in the composition part. Like, um, for example, before route enter, you cannot implement it in composition API. You only have it as an option. Uh, but that being said, you can also re-implement that through, uh, like the things you're doing before route enter, you can usually re-implement them through uh, before resolves and meta properties. Um, it's just that it's not that documented, so people don't know it, um, but it's doable. <laughs> um, other than that, the route and the router, well, the thing is, if you use the composition API, if you use the setup, you will need to use the, the use router and use route. If you don't, you still have these dot dollar route and these dot dollar router that are accessible. Those are always there. And last, the use link is more for advanced advanced use cases. You can still use router link. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, another question is, uh, while uh, there is still like uh, a very fast start on the new iteration of the router. Uh, what features uh, do you think it's uh, most important from your point of view to see later? I mean, we already talked a bit about uh, having ability to replace roads and so on and so on. I mean, not just adding mm -hmm. roads, uh, but uh, what are other features either on public roadmap or in your mind? Well, it's already there with the get routes. 
the public route mod. I mean, the if the get routes function gives you uh, all the routes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, well, uh, one I, I do have uh, other things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like, like um, all, all the things that are interesting is the lean version, which is something I, I look after, like probably after the release candidate or something like that, where we can have a version mm-hmm. of the router that is smaller, like lighter, by creating alternative versions of the matcher and the history implementation that do not support all the features, but can be switched like from one version to the other. <laughs> Yeah, that's probably GitLab could benefit in the future since we are not using, like I said before, we are not building a heavy single page application, but mm-hmm. a lot, a lot tiny application which still use a uh, router for some important parts. Uh, so we have a question from Dmitry. Uh, what is mm-hmm. a better way to keep some data while routing in metadata or maybe somewhere else? Uh, let me expand it a bit. For example, let's assume we are building some uh, wizards. So multi-step form and so on and so on, and we're building it mm-hmm. using router. What is, from your point of view, uh, best uh, approach to maintain some state across the roads? If you want to maintain the state uh, through navigation, you should go with some uh, state management pattern like Vuex. Um, so it's not about pushing it, keep pushing it into the state so you have it in every single navigation, unless and unless you are building progressively some kind of state and you want to restore that version when you go back in the history. Uh, but most of the time it doesn't really matter because you're just adding stuff to the state. So you're just only displaying a, a smaller version in every single page. For example, a form uh, that goes through multiple pages, you probably want to um, either host that form in a parent route or host it in a state management pattern like Vuex. Yeah, got it. Uh, just from my experience, uh, I was using like some hacky way of storing the metadata in the previous version of the router when I was building the multi-step form when the next step depends on the, what you choose in the previous one. So maintaining this in one Vuex store was a bit painful, uh, <laughs> but uh, whatever. Uh, another question is, uh, it's just more about the great development process. Uh, there are, of course, multiple routers uh, for different frameworks. React have many. It's a typical situation in React land. They have React router, React mm. reach router, whatever. Uh, Angular has its own router. Uh, are you uh, examining them for kind of best practices, approaches, or so on? Or this is just based on your feelings and your experience with the previous version of uh, the view router just just that. I, I use, uh, yes, I inspire myself from other routers, see what they are bringing uh, to the table, see what new things they have. Uh, bugs, they have fixed maybe that are nasty, like nasty edge cases for browsers. Uh, this kind of stuff, you find the same fixes in all browse, in all routers. Uh, the thing is, you cannot inspire yourself from everything because, for example, React Router is, is based on declarative routing. And in View Router, we the, the recommended approach is not to use that. Now with the dynamic routing, you could theoretically implement uh, declarative routing. And then the Angular routing, in my opinion, feels very heavy when it comes to all the things that it exposes, a bit overcomplicated. Uh, and in the other hand, real router is lacking uh, all the things, like for example, properly um, and giving you support for building URLs and coding, you have to do it yourself. Um, so you are exposed to the problems ba- depending on the router that the user is, is using, which I don't think is optimal. Yeah, uh, got it. Uh, so uh, another question is, uh, you talk it a lot about uh, browser problems and uh, testing that should be a pain. Uh, what What is the process for a view router uh, for testing, for cross-browser testing? Just, uh, are you using browser stack or whatever? How you're making sure yeah. that everything works, especially when you're using when you have bugs in all Safari versions and so on. Yeah. So we have end-to-end tests for um, that we run on browser stack, and we have some tests that only run in some browsers and others that do not run in, in all browsers. 
so that's how we handle the cross browser cross browser testing now the things is sometimes i do have unit tests because they are more like easier to check and it's a very a very specific thing like oh setting the variable um, in this browser does this thing. So it's easier to write a unit test and document the, the unit test saying, oh, this is the problem that is is solving. Rather than creating a new whole end-to-end test that also takes multiple seconds to run, whereas the unit test takes uh, some milliseconds. <laughs> also, I do some manual testing as well by myself, um, um, but I try to reduce that to a, to a bare minimum. So basically, when I'm introducing new things, when I'm working on the see if the encoding is working properly or not, I did my initial test with all the characters, see what browsers were doing to find a compromise on what characters to um, to uh, encode and what not. But I did that once, uh, and then all the scrolling behavior and stuff like that, I have some end-to-end tests that I can run across different browsers automatically on browser stack usually. <laughs> Yeah, uh, actually, uh, another question is uh, that let's imagine uh, that uh, I believe that you're releasing a totally new version of Vue Router using an opportunity that Vue 3 uh, is not fully backwards compatible with Vue 2. So it's like like a good time. Uh, mm. But uh, if that would not happen, uh, how do you feel uh, like uh, is the old version, the current version of your router still sufficient? Or, uh, for example, uh, if there will be not such opportunity, you will have a strong desire to release new version, even if your free will not be on the table. I mean, uh, do you feel that feeling of old legacy code, like, okay, now I know how to do this right? We know everyone that feeling. <laughs> yeah. Or this is just like using a time frame. <laughs> no, it, there is a feeling of, oh, these things are coupled together and I need to break a lot of things to make it work. So there is a lot of rewriting that I could have done for the current version of your router that I haven't done. It's a lot of work. And I even initially when I was working on the new router, it was because Vue, uh, Vue 3 was, wasn't um, ready yet to test. I was... Uh, building it for Vue 2, and it was working with, with Vue 2. Uh, and I think that the layer of Vue 2 is still quite thin. I mean, Vue 3. Um, the layer that is Vue 3 specific is quite thin. I don't have any plans. Like, it's not a priority to release a version that will work with Vue 2 because I don't think people will really benefit much from that. But it's it's doable. <laughs> like, it's not that the, you can swap that version. And there was that. There was a oh, all this code is now coupled and I need to decouple it. And I've been thinking about the problem and I've been implementing things and rewriting things. And I've been able to uh, restructure things in a way that is completely different. So I take that uh, into account and also the fact that I want to break some of the behaviors, very little actually, but most of them are just APA changes, like renaming some of the things, but some, some other Changes are for the better, but are technically breaking. So those are also cover uh, then, for example, um, some encoding stuff that is problematic, but will be technically a breaking change. Um, the active behavior is technically a breaking change, but it's improvement. Um, the changing of errors, uh, I mean, the navigation failures and how they are like changing the rejection into a you know, resol- resolution will be a breaking change, so I have to do it in a V4. Are you there? So, looks like we have some um, some 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 difficulties, and. Um, Eduardo, I have uh, another question, if you can answer it. Yes, I can see yes, them on the, on the chat as well. <laughs> ah, okay. Except for the Russian ones, I cannot read them, but the English ones I can. <laughs> yeah, so actually the... Um, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, Ilya, are you here? Yeah. Ah, okay, yeah, it was a, a, a bit silence from you, so yeah, I'm, I'm here just to... Uh, maybe you can continue with the questions. 
Yeah, I have. I, I was like <laughs> actually asking the Hollywood question, so probably someone cut me from internet. Uh, how do you feel about TypeScript? Amazing, it's really great. <laughs> uh, we don't use a full potential. I think that the generics things is really cool, uh, but it's, for example, not really used in the router because there is no such need. And adding the the <laughs> generics to some of the stuff will complicate things even more because you have to take into account that types should be usable by people who are also learning TypeScript, but we try to give the full potential to people who know TypeScript well. <laughs> And I think that where it really shines is in things like state management. So for example, the new version of UX will be really cool um, when it comes to type, typing support, especially compared to the existing version of UX. And I did some testing, like um, brainstorming on, on what could be a state management using this composition API in a project called Pina. And I, I think that UX, uh, the next version for V3 will pretty much make Pinia uh, um, obsolete because it will have all the APIs that Pinia has and probably more. So that's really cool. Uh, for the for the view router, it has made the, some of the refactoring really easy as well when you have some type changing or the, or you just change the name, refactor the name and then see where the types are breaking and then your tests are, are failing. And as soon as you fix all the naming of the, um, other properties or, 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 or you introduce a type that is a, um, an union, then you have to do the correct ifs. So it, it basically guides you through where you have to add or change code. And that's so cool. Make my life easier for sure. <laughs> uh, from Halivar question to the practice one, uh, is it possible to get a previous route using use route and not using on before route enter? I'm not using the frame. so use route will only give you the current uh, the current route now in the there is no variable containing the the previous route uh, on view router but it's super easy to implement on user land especially with the new version the problem with the previous version is that we have some inconsistencies when it comes to uh, router push and before each and after each. Uh, with the new version, is very consistent. So every router push, push will call a before each unless it's canceled before uh, by another before each. Uh, and you all, also always call after each. So you can host very easily with a ref, with a composition API, you can host a variable that contains the previous route where we were at before navigating and update it uh, in after each every time. So then you just import it anywhere and you can create a use previous route. We could even create ourselves a use previous route that does that and it will be tree shakeable and everything. Uh, I, I, don't have, I don't have any plans to add it to the view router um, code, but it's definitely something that can be added to a cookbook page, for example, and it's a piece of code that is very easy to show. Yeah, uh, and another question is uh, that, uh, could you please explain another time for our, uh, for our, for me also, by the way, uh, I, I pro probably also did not fully understand what kind of features will uh, give the new router for displaying models. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, your conditional rendering ex example, could you explain it mm. just a bit more? Yeah, I, I know it's a bit, uh, it's totally fair. Uh, it's a very, um, very quick example. Let me just go back to the, to the slide. Uh, it's, it's not even complete um, because the thing is also something else that we can do with the router is push a state, but this is not um, like a, navi a state of the navigation. It's just state that is saved within the history entry. So it's limited by the history API. Like we don't have a way to save state uh, like we don't want to introduce a navigation state, so to say, apart from what exists from the route from the browser. So, for example, things like symbols are not allowed; they're just stripped, and nothing happens. And you probably have size limitations. Um, so, when we push to a location, we can push with a state, and then we can read the state. So, in the example, I have this history state. Do I have my my cursor? No, I cannot. I cannot show the cursor. Well, now I can. For some reason, I cannot show it, but the history state is a computer that will, uh, so it does route and history window state. So what this does is 
it tells the computer property to depend on route. So any every navigation will change the route because uh, it always creates a new object. So this history state will always be up to date to the current history that state value, the global value. And then we can check if we pushed uh, an entry with a state that contains maybe a, a background view and we're going to display the background component. So that means that um, we're going to push, for example, we want to go to the user page, but we uh, want to display a model instead. Although Twitter works as well. Like you click on a tweet, you want to display a model, for example. It's not what always that happens now, but it doesn't matter. So you click there and what happens is that in the code, you're going to write a router push and you're going to add to the object push a state with a uh, background view that equals uh, the current URL, basically, which is, I don't know, the main page or the timeline, whatever you, you have. And now what you do is, um, so you have this computer property that will, if it, it will look at this variable and if it's the case, it will return the, it will resolve that, that route to give the, the router view an object that it can understand and build the, current, the visible view. And if it's not the case, it's going to return the current route. Like the, the return route you see there is the same as used route from, from above. So that one is connected to the URL. But because we changed the URL to go somewhere else, we don't want to display that. So that's why we have to save in the history state the actual view that we want to display. And we also use that history state in the same page to display a model. And that has a, that, that's how we can uh, display models uh, uh, with navigation working correctly. Uh, and then when you reload a page, because the router is just going to look at the URL. Actually, even when you reload a page, you still have the model if you want. Uh, you can you can make it work. By default, it will, if using this method, it will work. I don't know if that, that makes it a bit clearer. Yeah, actually implementing that uh, Twitter-like pop-ups when, uh, for example, the tweet or whatever pop-up could be either have a news feed on background or have nothing in background when just this pop-up was a very, very big pain point personally for mm. me in the previous view router. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, so it's so example. difficult to implement. Yeah, it requires some hacks around name it roads. <laughs> Yeah, and not the clearest <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah, uh, and uh, another question is that view three separated the uh, renderer from the core, so potentially uh, we are targeting some more platforms than just web. So potentially we could have some additional renders to Canvas, to WebGL, have, uh, let's call it normal uh, native implementations. Of course, we have ones like uh, what we have, view native and view... Uh, view native script sorry i may may may, may be messing with naming but they're far from perfect uh is uh, have you played with it with new history now being separated as abstraction lawyer uh are you play have you played with uh using your router somewhere not just on the web <laughs> so i i i haven't been able to to use it not on the web uh, because I don't have access to the code of native script that works with Vue 3. Uh, I, I'm in contact with the people who develop it and I'm there uh, to help them when, when they need. Um, I'm proactive. <laughs> I try to, I'm, I'm proactive when it comes to the, to the communication because I know they had troubles before and I want to, and, and I try to make a version that is over, overwritable, but I don't, uh, I know some of the things about um, stack navigation that they use. And I know what can be, so I know what needs to be overridden in the router to make that work. So I'm trying to make that part public when it comes to the API. Uh, I haven't also, I haven't <clears throat> uh, played with custom renderers, although I have seen them in, in, in use, but the router shouldn't um, interfere much with that because you can still use the, um, you can do whatever you want. Like you could, the thing is, um, the route still need a component, but because we have this meta property, you could give whatever you want to, to the route. And then you could create your own custom router view that will use something different. But at the end, 
if even if you're using a custom renderer, you're still using components. So I think using your router will still be the same, probably. Yeah, and uh, what is the ugliest and the most hated bug or problem you've encountered during developing this version? Well, it will, it will be the most complicated thing. <laughs> the different question. <laughs> uh, the the one that was the most complicated was uh, handling all the cases with aliases when it comes to active behavior. But it's also something I introduced myself. <laughs> it didn't work on the current version of your router, the aliases. Uh, and now with the new version, no matter how many aliases you have, they are all active if one of them is active. Uh, it works seamlessly. So that's hard. And the, the one I'm having the most trouble with is because we need to add some stuff on view uh, and I, I'm still working on it. It's uh, supporting um, this, the, the context, the component. <laughs> in um, before route uh, update and before I'll leave for components that are for router view that are, that have to be rendered and inside of keep alive or transition because there are some uh, different differences when it comes to functional components and normal components in v3 so in view 2 it's super easy to write the keep alive around the router view and it just works but that's not possible for the next version because there is a difference now so we have to find another way. And there is an open RFC about that. And um, while there is still some conversation ongoing, it's a bit more difficult than it looks. <laughs> yeah, and we have time for uh, another very, very quick uh, question. Uh, and uh, it is quite simple. Uh, view ecosystem and also view router has uh, one of the best docs compared to the uh, mm -hmm. other way. Uh, how how hard is to write doc which is so understandable for everyone? Okay, it's it's funny because I don't I think that the router docs are the, the least understandable of all the ecosystem. I mean, all the ecosystem, all the official official libraries. So I. I really want to improve those, and I don't write the docs documentation for the main repository. I think that Natalia was also a speaker today uh, at Holy Jazz, and she's also a core team member. And she works a lot. She has been she has been rewriting a lot of the things for View Three. We have all the people in the team like Sarah Grasner. We have Ben. We have Anne Fan. Um, so we have a, a whole team <laughs> that takes. A lot of time. Uh, I think my personal uh, recommendation is uh, to uh, learn about empathy. Uh, I think it's the most valuable skill when it comes to writing docs um, and write, writing docs that are understandable and that people enjoy reading. I know it sounds quite disconnected, uh, like how do you go from empathy to documentation, but it's worth. Uh, it's something that takes a lot of time to build also, and it's worth reading maybe books and articles about psychology and, and empathy and being able to be in the other place, uh, in someone else's uh, boots. And, and, and maybe uh, if that helps to people putting multiple profiles of difficulty and, and, and also what always, always works is showing the documentation to different profiles and, and see how they, they, they understand it. Okay, guys, um, that's, that's it for the questions, but for the viewers, of course, you can catch uh, Eduardo and Ilya in the discussion zone in Zoom, and you should have a link right now. So thank you guys for, thank you Eduardo for your talk. It was super deep and awesome. Thank you, Ilya, for comments, and uh, have a great evening in Zoom. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah.